Hello people and welcome to the Counterfactual Stories YouTube channel. In this episode let's see how is related Hans Niemann and Sex Toys. Before we start, don't forget to press subscribe button. The world of competitive chess is being torn apart by some of the most unbelievable drama in the history of the game. At its center, uh, Magnus Carlsen, the 31-year-old legend who has been the world's number one ranked player for an astonishing 11 years. A 19-year-old named Hans Niemann, a player from San Francisco, who prior to 2022 was only known by the deepest of chess fans and the most astonishing game in recent memory. Perhaps you have heard of this story in passing, maybe you have caught in simplets here or there. You might know by know that Neiman beat Carlsen in one of the world's most prestigious tournaments, leading the, to the world number one withdrawing and suggesting his opponent cheated. But this is a winding tale so rife with lies and rumors that it's becoming impossible to find the head of this snake. So let's go back to where this all began and unpack the mystery of Neiman beating Carlsen. It's at least worth trying to separate the truth from the fiction. One of the biggest changes lived against uh, Hans Niemann is based on the lie that as a chess player he ostensibly showed up and beat this best player in the world. While it's true that traditional chess ranking and tradition uh, tells us that nobody of Niemann's skill level should beat someone of Carson level, it doesn't mean he walked off the street or something. Nima's chess career began in 2012 at the age of 9. He struggled early on, as one would expect, but steadily improved as he played more tournaments. In 2016, Neiman was named to US Chess Federation's All America Chess Team, which he has been a member of, sin of, science, of since. Also that year, he tied for first place at the North America Youth Championship, his first major win. An active competitor for much of his life, in 2020 Neiman completed the recruitment to receive the title of Grandmaster. As a young player, he was already establishing himself as a player to watch, and this continued in early 2022 when he achieved the rank of number 98 in the world, his first trip into the top 100. You might look at that brief bio of Neiman and say to yourself, why couldn't he win? The answer is simple, he is not supposed to. This is not a game of wild upsets unpredictably and shock performances, which is the heart of why Neiman beating Carlsen is such a headline on its own. Its own. The ELO rating system, which has been chess primary skill measurement since 1960, something like that, is a complicated mathematical equation uh, that ends up giving players a numerical score that theoretically has no maximum. ELO uh, uh, can conceivably go forever, but as it stands, Carson has the highest ELO in the history of chess with 2882, which he achieved in 2019. In the world of ELO, every point matters, but mathematically, the difference becomes significant with each 100 point difference. For example, if one player has an ELO of 2500 and the other has 2600, then the higher scoring player should win 64% of games. If that number climbs to a 200 points differential, then the better player should win 76% of games. This means that if you are there to rook up, unranked, never playing a competitive game of chess in your life against Magnus Carlsen, your odds of winning according to ELO is, are statistically zero. Yes, absolute zero. More specifically, you are calculated to have a 0.00% chance of winning. You need to reach an ELO of 1,150 to even gain a single fractional chance of winning at 0.00001%. In the case of Carlsen and Neiman, we are not talking about the difference of thousands of points, but rather 200, roughly the gap between the players when they met for the infamous games in St. Louis. The devil is in the details though, because while that was the rank between the players, there are questions where are well. The questions here are well. Here is where things get a lot more sticky. 
Conceptually, the idea of the error should slowly, steadily improve over time so long as a player main time maintains the same level of play. Traditionally, this is what we see, an expected huge jump from a player's debut to their mid-teens, then leveling off to show their true skill. For the most part, players really uh, top uh, out by age 16 or 17, more or less looking in their general L range, from there it makes slow improvement over time, but no more mammoth jumps. When it comes to Magnus Carlsen, he crossed an elo of 2700 in the mid-2007, and since that time has spent 15 years improving 180 points in elo. This is the greatest player of all time. Neiman's elo chart is a lot more bizarre. Neiman's hit the same 1670 year old players hit, but then exploded again in 2021, taking his elo from 2484 at the start of the year to 2668 now. This means that Neiman took 15 years of slow, steady Carlson improvement and crammed into 12 into 20 months. It's true that climbing from the 2400s to the 2600s is far easier than 2700s to 2800s. However, the timeline simply doesn't match anything of other professional chess player. How did Neiman stay stagnant for almost two years before quickly becoming one of the greatest players in the world? This is more curious because it coincides with him becoming one of the most popular chess streamers on Twitch, which gained him a huge audience, and with it pressure to keep improving. Neiman met Carlsen in the third round of the Sinkfield Cup in St. Louis, one of the largest and most prestigious tournaments in the world. It was a match that all odds and every ounce of logic said Carlsen should win easily. Instead, the world number one never looked comfortable. He played aggressive with his rook on move 10, but was counterattacked through the match, forcing some awkward trades. By move 57, Carlsen was done, left wondering how he got so atrociously beaten by a player who shouldn't have stood a chance. After the game, Neiman said that he had internally studied the Carlsen specifically, preparing himself wholly to take down the world number one. Carlsen quit the tournament the following morning and seemed to indicate that he believed Neiman had cheated in their match. The 2014 clip of 10 Chelsea manager Jose Mourinho occurred following a question about referee Chris Foy, who the manager often had this disdain for. It was essentially shorthand for Carlsen saying he believed there was him properly, but didn't want to go get in trouble for speaking out against Neiman. Now we had the seed planted, the best player in the world, beaten by a player he shouldn't lose to, now making subtle accusations, his opponent cheated. Now it was time for the internet to dive in, people began examining Neiman's moves and realized he opened with a variation of the Nimza Indian defense, a known chess opener, but something Neiman was barely ever used in professional games, and never too much success. It raised eyebrows. If you are in the biggest game of your chess career, do you really go all in on a defense you have barely ever used before? Did Neiman make the move, or did the information come from somewhere else? This is where we go from questions about skills and ranking and take them into the world of the surreal. There is only one conceivable way someone can cheat in a live chess game, and that's with the aid of a chess uh, artificial intelligence examining the board and feeding optimal moves to a player via wireless device. Most often, this is imagined as a small receiver in a shoe sending vibration to player's foot or ankle, but the internet being the internet, people began speculating that Neiman was using vibration, uh, vibrating anal beats to tell him what move to make. This would have ended as dumb online speculation until this happened. Elon Musk tweeted, talent hits a target no one else can hit, genius hit a target no one can see, cause it's in your butt, Schopenhauer. 
In a now deleted tweet, Elon Musk made a quip about the anal bead theory on his army of worshippers passed this off and made it manifest. Suddenly, it was accepted that the anal bead theory was the only way Neiman could ever beat Carlson and it spread like a wildfire. No longer was this simply the story of a player winning and his opponent suggesting he was cheating. It was the sex toy weird cheater beating the best player in the world. The suggestion got so bad that Neiman claimed he would play naked to prove he wasn't using any kind of device. Up to this point you have be forgiven for seeing Neiman as purely an innocent party in all these catching strays. There was absolutely no evidence he cheated at the Singfield, outside of Carlson cryptic allegations and suggestions on the internet. Maybe he was just a great player who managed to have the game of his life. Just as the discussion hanged in the balance, another pro, Hikaru Nikamura, revealed that Neiman had previously been banned from chess.com, the largest chess site in the world for cheating in tournaments. When asked about this, Neiman acknowledged that he did cheat when he was younger, but only in online games, never ever the board in person. Other than saying this happened many years earlier, we don't really know when it's cheating, when this cheating took place. When you are taking about 19 year old, this is important. Uh, was he 13 and didn't know any better? Or was this a case of Neiman cheating after he would already establish his chess career? We simply don't have any the answer, but that's a critical piece of information. In any event, chess.com decided to rebound Neiman following his admission, despite there being no recent evidence of him cheating on their, on their platform. The move seemingly cited the chess site with Carlsen against Neiman, serving uh, as a third party to adjudicate, adjudicate on the issue, sorry about this. If they have evidence he's been recently using a chess bot, we haven't seen it. So it's been suggested that the timing of Nima's meteoric rise is curious considering its coincidence with war stages of the COVID pandemic when in-person chess was banned and all tournaments were taking place online. Uh, the turn after uh, the attention and drama might have been good for the world of chess in some ways, but seriously, players and analysts just wanted it all go away. For a while, it seemed that a rematch scheduled between Carlsen and Neiman might kill the discussion once and for all. Either the world number one would mop the floor with his opponent, establishing that the Sinfield Cup match was at the best a fluke, or Neiman would win, proving that he's just a brilliant player on the rise instead. Uh, this happened. Magnus resigns after one move against Neiman. Analysts were left stunned when Carlsen cut his webcam off after one move and resigned from the match. It was clearly a form of protest and Carlsen deliberately opened with the identical move that Neiman used against him in St. Louis. There was no subtly or a guessing this time, he was establishing very clearly that he thinks Neiman is a cheater. Nobody knows. There isn't really anything actionable on either side here, which is what keeping the dramas feeling. Carlson is known for being emotional and a poor loser, so it's difficult to put too much weight in his reaction alone. While on the other side, there is a still not a shred of evidence that Neiman cheated in any of the recent games. It's messy, it's ugly, and one of the world's oldest games was has never seen drama quite like this. At least not in the modern era. Chess fans are dividing themselves into cramp, uh, camps, either standing with Marcus or Neiman, and there is no end in sight to all of this. This whole scenario may not be good for the po Polish stoic image of professional chess, but more people are paying attention, paying attention to the game than ever. Whether that's good or not, it's up to you. I hope you really like this episode. Don't forget to press subscribe button and see you soon. Bye.